Hello, and welcome to the Chapter 10, Parts 2 and 3 online lecture. You should use the information in this lecture to complete the Chapter 10, Parts 2 and 3 guided notes, which of course should be completed before you come to class. In Parts 2 of 3 of this chapter, we're really going to dig into the nitty-gritty of photosynthesis. In part one, we reviewed the two major reactions that make up photosynthesis, where they happen inside the chloroplast, and the major reactants and products of those reactions. Now, if you don't remember those reactions very well, I'm going to suggest that you go back to part one and review before you start digging very far into this part of the chapter, because you're going to need that information to understand what we're about to do. Let's get started. Let's review the light-dependent reactions. Remember that the light-dependent reactions represent the photo part of photosynthesis. These are the light-capturing reactions. The point of these reactions is to capture solar energy and change it into chemical energy by trapping it inside a couple of different energy carrier molecules, ATP and NADPH. Now let's think about the types of reactions that would be necessary to do this. In order to change ADP into ATP, what kind of reaction is necessary? Well, it's a phosphorylation. You have to add a phosphate group to ADP to change it into ATP. So we're going to need some machinery that can do that. Also during these reactions, we want to change NADP plus into NADPH. What kind of a reaction is that? Well, the plus sign on NADP plus indicates that it has lost some electrons. So in order to convert it into NADPH, it has to be reduced, which means it's gaining energy. Both ATP and NADPH have more potential energy than their oxidized counterparts. So that's where that solar energy is going, is into these two molecules. Now also during these reactions, we're going to have some machinery that changes water into oxygen gas. If you remember, this is the opposite reaction to what we had in cellular respiration, where oxygen gas was combined with hydrogens and electrons and changed into water. Why does that happen? Well, there's an explanation for that as well. Let's dig into the machinery of these reactions. Let's travel inside the chloroplast. Remember that the chloroplast has two membranes, an outer membrane made of phospholipids and an inner membrane made of phospholipids that's folded into these weird little stack-like structures called thylakoids. This is what a thylakoid might look like if we blow it up. You can see that it really is just a piece of membrane that's folded over and over and over on itself into these kind of tall sacks, these stacks of sacks like this, and that there's space inside where different kinds of reactions can happen. The thylakoids are the major site for our light reactions. Now let's look at this image. I really like this image. This image shows you what it might look like if we were inside a chloroplast. Maybe if you were really tiny, you could stand on the outside of a thylakoid and look around. And this is what it might look like. Here you can see the heads of the phospholipids kind of poking out. And we also have these other weird structures. These structures contain the chlorophyll pigments that make this whole thing green. Now if we cut one of these thylakoids open and look at it from the side, it might look kind of like this. Look at all the machinery that's built into these thylakoids. This is the machinery that builds ATP and NADPH for us. And we're going to see how this works next. Here's a simplified version of the machines of the light reactions. First, let's remember the purpose of these machines. The purpose of the light reactions is to capture the energy of sunlight in molecules such as ATP and NADPH. Now, how do the machines accomplish this? Well, notice that they are an assembly line. Each machine within this chain is connected both physically and energetically to the machines around it. So in order for this chain to work, we need a constant flow of energy from the beginning all the way to the end. What would carry that energy for us? Well, think back to cellular respiration. The energy in cellular respiration was carried in the form of electrons. 
So what we have is a system that depends on linear electron flow. The electrons, which are energized by sunlight, power these machines. Let's break this giant machine down and talk about each part in a little bit more detail. First, we're going to discuss these machines known as photosystems. The photosystems capture light energy. They contain molecules known as pigments. The major pigment is chlorophyll, which is why these guys are green. And the pigments capture light energy. Notice that the names of these photosystems are reversed. And no, that's not a typo for once. The very first photosystem that occurs in the chain is called photosystem 2, or PS2. And the second one that occurs in the chain is called photosystem 1, or PS1. Now why is that? Well, photosystem 1 was the first one that was discovered and characterized. So when they discovered a second photosystem that existed and noticed that it was a little bit different, they decided, well, we'll call it photosystem 2 since it was discovered second. Seems a little weird, but that's the names you have to learn. To understand how the photosystems absorb light, you need to know a little bit more about light energy and how it works. Light is a really strange critter. It is a form of energy, but it's a form of energy that exists both as particles, called photons, and also waves. So you can imagine light as being emitted from this light bulb in the form of little particles that are kind of flying out into the space around it. But it also makes these kind of electromagnetic waves in the space around it. All of the different forms of light that we know to exist make up what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. On the high energy side of the spectrum we have gamma rays, x-rays, and UV radiation. These forms of light um, carry a lot of energy and can actually be dangerous and damaging to living things. On the other end of the spectrum we have infrared light and radio waves. Those are low energy forms of light. Notice that right in the middle of the spectrum we have visible light. This is the light that we actually experience as color. Light travels through space in the form of waves. You can think of it as being kind of like the ripples on the surface of water. Different forms of light have different amounts of energy and therefore have different sizes of waves, and we call these different wavelengths. Notice that on the very energetic side of the spectrum, we have light that has very, very short wavelengths. And on the less energetic end of the spectrum, we have longer, long, slow wavelengths. This also applies to our visible light that we can actually see. The violet end of the spectrum has shorter wavelengths, and the red end of the spectrum tends to have these big, long, low, slow wavelengths. Visible light in the middle of the electromagnetic spectrum is used for several different processes inside living things. It's used to generate our vision, of course, but it's also used for photosynthesis. So why is this? Well, visible light is just right in terms of energy. It doesn't have so much energy that it can be damaging, but it has enough energy so that it can perform work. Visible light ranges from 380 nanometers to 750 nanometers, and you might notice that these are the wavelengths that we use when we use our spectrophotometers in lab. Different colors of light energy within the visible spectrum carry different amounts of energy. Violet light down here on this end of the spectrum has the shortest wavelength, so it carries the most energy. The green and yellow lights in the middle carry a little bit of energy, kind of a medium amount, and red and orange light at the other end of the spectrum carries the least amount of energy. It has those big, long, slow wavelengths. Sunlight contains all of the different colors of the rainbow, all of the different wavelengths of light. And three things can happen to the light when it strikes an object. 
the light might be transmitted all the way through the object. Or the light can be reflected off the object. Or certain wavelengths of light are going to be absorbed by the object. Our spectrophotometers in lab measure the amount that's transmitted and the amount that is absorbed. Now the amount that is reflected results in our vision. So for instance, this object looks green in color. So what's happening is that the green wavelengths of light are being reflected by this object. So they are reflected up to our eyes and th thus we sense that this object is green. The other colors of light, the other wavelengths of light, are being absorbed by the object. So we don't see those colors of light. Different chemicals absorb and transmit different colors of light. This property is unique to each different type of chemical and can even be used to identify that chemical. Let's take potassium permanganate as an example, that purple chemical that you worked with back in lab two. If we take a sample of potassium permanganate and put it into a spectrophotometer and we zap it with different wavelengths of light, different colors of light, we can measure the absorbance of each wavelength. In other words, we can tell which colors of light this particular chemical is absorbing most strongly. Using this, we can make a graph known as an absorption spectrum. And we can use this pattern on the graph to identify the chemical. It's like a fingerprint for the chemical. Let's look at the absorb absorption spectrum for potassium permanganate. Notice that the absorbance is pretty low in this area of the visible spectrum. This end of the visible spectrum represents violet and some bluish light. Now that makes sense. This chemical isn't absorbing that light. This particular chemical reflects purple light, and that's why it looks purple to us. However, the absorbance is really high in the middle of the spectrum. This represents green and yellow light. The chemical doesn't look green or yellow to us because it's absorbing those wavelengths of light. Chlorophylls are the primary pigments found inside photosystems. This is a chlorophyll molecule over here on the right. There are different types of chlorophyll molecules. For instance, there's chlorophyll A and there's chlorophyll B, and they are both greenish in color, although they differ in color slightly. The presence of chlorophyll molecules is the reason that most plants are green in color. That's the pigment that they primarily use to absorb light. Now because these pigments are green in color, that means that these pigments reflect green light back to your eyes. So plants don't actually use green light in photosynthesis. Instead, these pigments are focused on absorbing violet, blue, and red wavelengths of light. So plants really prefer blue and red wavelengths. Those are the ones that they get their energy from. Plants use a number of other pigments besides chlorophyll to capture light energy. These other pigments we refer to as accessory pigments, and carotenoids are a great example of that. Carotenoids are orangey yellow in color, and because they are orangey yellow in color, it means that's the wavelengths of light that they are reflecting back to your eyes, and they are capturing blue and green wavelengths. So what this allows the plant to do is to capture even more energy from even more wavelengths of light. Let's look at the absorbance spectrum for um, these three pigments down here. What you can see is that the chlorophylls are really good at capturing light in this violet and in some of the blue areas, but not so great at capturing the green light. The carotenoids, however, have a little bit wider range. They can capture some of this green light. So by using a mixture of different pigments, plants can maximize the amount of energy that they capture. Over here on the right, we have a TLC plate that's very similar to the one that you ran in Lab 7. In Lab 7, you were primarily concerned with capturing three pigments, carotene, chlorophyll A, and chlorophyll B. And you used these three pigments to make an absorption spectrum. However, look at all these other pigments that are here. These all represent pigments that were present in the spinach leaf at the time that it was harvested. These pigments are also going to be used to capture light energy. If we were to run an absorption spectrum for these pigments, we'd find that they have each have their own unique pattern of absorbance. So different ones will absorb different wavelengths of light. And again, by using this 
big mixture of pigments, plants can really maximize the efficiency with which they absorb light. Exactly how do pigment molecules go about absorbing that light energy and capturing it? Well, here's a neat little experiment that kind of illustrates that. Here we have some chlorophyll extract just in a flask, not even in a living cell, just in a flask. If we shine UV light on that chlorophyll extract, the electrons attached to the chlorophylls become extremely excited. They absorb all that energy and they become very excited. And they need to release that energy really quickly. So they do that. As they are losing that energy and releasing it, it comes out as heat and light. And specifically, chlorophyll will release light in the red part of the spectrum. So when you shine a UV light on a sample of chlorophyll, it will glow red. Now what does this have to do with photosynthesis in a living cell? Well, the same basic thing happens inside a living cell when sunlight shines on chlorophyll pigments. But instead of releasing all of that energy as heat and light, machinery is present inside the thylakoids that will capture that energy and funnel it into ATP and NADPH. So what machinery am I talking about here? Well, as light strikes the pigment molecules inside a photosystem, the electrons within those photosystems become very, very excited. And they are going to be released from that photosystem and captured by electron transport chains. Here you can see the first electron transport chain captures those energized electrons. As they pass the electrons down the chain from one molecule to the next, they pull some of the energy out of those electrons. That energy can be used to do work. Once the electrons get to the bottom of this first electron transport chain, they're pretty depleted, they're pretty tired. So they get passed into another photosystem where they get zapped with light energy again, they get energized again, and a second electron transport chain grabs them and starts making use of that energy. Here's a little bit more realistic diagram of our thylakoid machinery. The photosystems are circled in yellow. Remember that the photosystems are named in reverse order, so PS2 occurs in the chain before PS1. Also notice that these two photosystems are connected together by an electron transport chain. Each photosystem consists of two different parts an antenna complex, and a reaction center. The outer layer of a photosystem is an area called the antenna complex. This antenna complex that wraps all around the center of this thing is just packed full of pigment molecules. There's a whole bunch of chlorophylls and other pigments in there. Now, how does this antenna complex work? Well, light energy comes down and it's going to strike these chlorophyll molecules and other pigments. The electrons of those molecules are going to get very, very excited. And they're going to get so energized and excited that they're going to try and detach from their pigments. So these electrons are going to start kind of bouncing around inside this antenna complex. And they'll end up being passed from one to the next to the next to the next as they gain energy. Eventually, some of the electrons in the antenna complex are going to become so energized and so excited that they're going to pass out of the antenna complex and into the center of this thing. We call the center of this thing the reaction center. And in the reaction center, we have a special pair of chlorophyll molecules that will accept that really, really excited electron. Now what happens next is kind of interesting. This pair of chlorophyll molecules will pass that electron out of the reaction center. So the electron's actually going to leave this photosystem altogether. Now it's kind of fun to imagine it as being like a little cannon that just like shoots electrons out, but of course that would be very dangerous to the cell. So it doesn't shoot them out, it just passes them to another molecule outside of the photocenter. 
Now, who is going to accept these really excited electrons that are shooting out of these photosystems? Well, again, they're going to be accepted by the electron transport chains. There are two different electron transport chains, and they are attached to different machines. So let's take a look at each of them. The electron transport chains are attached to different machines that are going to do some work for us. So the ETCs provide the energy for the work, and the machines actually do the work. This first electron transport chain is attached to a machine that's going to make ATP. The second electron transport chain is attached to a machine that's going to make NADPH. The electron transport chains don't really have official names, so I'm unofficially calling this first one the ATP electron transport chain, or the ATP ETC for short. This electron transport chain extends from photosystem 2 all the way over here to photosystem 1, so it shuttles electrons between those photosystems. It's also going to use that energy to do some work. So what work does this ATP ETC actually do? Well, this system is actually very similar to the ETC that you saw in Chapter 9. This system acts as a hydrogen pump. What it's going to do is it's going to grab hydrogen ions that are floating around out here in the stroma, I'll say ST for stroma, and it's going to grab them and pump them through that thylakoid membrane and trap them inside the thylakoid membrane. So it's creating a high concentration of hydrogen ions in here. In other words, just as with the ETC that you saw in Chapter 9, it's creating a proton gradient. It's pooling up that solar energy inside the thylakoids. What's the energy inside that proton gradient used for? Well, let's look here. Here's a very familiar looking enzyme. At least I hope it looks a little familiar. ATP synthase. ATP synthase, if you remember, uses a hydro hydrogen gradient to make ATP. So the hydrogen that is now trapped inside this thylakoid is going to want to flow out because it's crowded and unhappy. When ATP synthase opens its channels and allows it to flow through, that's going to get these little parts moving again, and it will allow ATP synthase to make some ATP. So in this way, energy has been transferred from light into electrons. It's been used to pool up hydrogen ions, which also represent energy, and then that energy has been used to make ATP. So our energy has been transferred into ATP. So in summary, the electron transport chain proteins pump hydrogen ions from the stroma, that liquid outside, into the thylakoid space, thus creating a hydrogen gradient that can be used for ATP synthesis. If you remember, ATPs are formed by taking ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and adding a phosphate group to it. That ends up making ATP. This type of a reaction is known as a phosphorylation. Now because this particular phosphorylation involves the sun, it has its own special term. And look at this fantastically long word. This process is known as photophosphorylation. Incidentally, if you can somehow find the cunning and the courage to use the word photophosphorylation in a Scrabble game, I can guarantee you will absolutely win and crush your enemies. The second electron transport chain doesn't have an official name either, so I'm unofficially calling it the NADPH electron transport chain or the NADPH ETC. It extends from photosystem 1 to the end of the chain, where NADPH is made. This system is much simpler than the other electron transport chain. 
it takes electrons that have been energized by photosystem 1 that it collected from the last electron transport chain and it passes it into a couple of proteins. This last protein in the chain is known as NADP plus reductase. So think about that for a moment. This name tells you what the enzyme does. It reduces NADP plus into NADPH. It adds those electrons to the NADP plus and allows it to combine with some hydrogen to make this final energy product. This reduced product carries more energy than the oxidized form of the electron carrier. So the energy from photosystem one that came from the sun gets funneled into electrons, which gets passed to this enzyme, which then gets funneled directly into NADPH. Energy has been converted from a solar type of energy into chemical energy. What happens to the two products of the light reactions now? Well, notice where they've been formed. This area represents the thylakoid membrane. Inside here we have the TS, thylakoid space, and out here we have the stroma, STR, I will kind of say. Both of the products of the light reactions have been produced on the stroma side. So the ATP that was made and the NADPH that was made are now going to travel out in the stroma to the enzymes that control the Calvin cycle. In other words, the products of the light reactions of the photo part are now going to travel into the synthesis part where sugars are going to be built. There's one more little piece to add to this light reaction puzzle. Remember that this entire system depends on linear electron flow. In other words, electrons have to flow from one end of this thing all the way to the other end of this thing and will eventually be captured by NADPH. And if the flow of electrons stops, this machine shuts down. So because electrons are constantly being pulled out of photosystem 2 to start this whole chain, those electrons need to be replaced. Who's going to replace them? Well, that's where water comes in. Water is going to be broken down, it will be stripped of some of its electrons, and those will be placed in photosystem 2 to replenish it. The byproduct of that is going to be O2 or oxygen gas. In this reaction, each water molecule is broken down into two hydrogen ions two electrons and a single oxygen atom. The hydrogen ions are pumped into the thylakoid space, so they actually help build that proton gradient that's going to help make some ATP. The two electrons that are stripped go back into photosystem 2 to replenish them from the electrons that are removed. And after two cycles of this, the two oxygen atoms get together and make O2. The O2 gas that's produced during photosynthesis will build up as the plant photosynthesizes and eventually it will diffuse out of the bottom of the leaf through those little holes we saw called the stroma. Here you can see an elodia plant and because elodia plants are aquatic this is underwater and you can actually see the little bubbles of oxygen diffusing out of the leaves. Here's the entire machine put together. Out here we have the stroma and inside the thylakoid we have the thylakoid space and that's separated by this nice big membrane. Here's the machine. The machine is going to collect light energy in the form of ele excited electrons in the photosystem 2. Those are going to pass out of photosystem 2 through an electron transport chain and into photosystem 1. This in turn is going to give that electron transport chain the energy it needs to pump hydrogen into the thylakoid space, creating a hydrogen gradient. That hydrogen gradient will then be used along with ATP synthase to make ATP. Meanwhile, the electrons in photosystem 1 are going to get energized by the sun's energy again. They're going to flow into a second electron transport chain until they reach this enzyme, NADP plus reductase.
That enzyme takes NADP plus and some hydrogen and those electrons and puts them together into NADPH. Now the two products of the light reactions, the ATP and the NADPH, can travel out into the stroma to be used in the Calvin cycle. Meanwhile, water is going to be broken down and its electrons are going to be added back into photosystem 2 to keep this whole cycle going and oxygen gas is going to be made as a byproduct. The second set of reactions that make up photosynthesis go by several different names. They represent the synthesis part of photosynthesis. Sometimes they are called the light independent reactions or the dark reactions because they do not directly require light. Sometimes they are also called the Calvin-Benson cycle or sometimes just the good old Calvin cycle. So what's the point of this set of reactions? Well, of course, it's to make glucose. We're going to make sugars. That's what we're synthesizing in these reactions. Now making glucose, building a big molecule, is endergonic in nature. It's anabolic in nature, so that requires energy. Where do we get the energy? Well, we get that energy from the ATP and the NADPH that was formed in the last set of reactions. So these energized molecules travel across the cell to where the Calvin cycle is going to happen. Those molecules will then be broken down again, and their energy will be used to build glucose. So ATP is going to get broken back down into ADP, and NADPH is going to get broken back down into NADP+. Let's think about those specific reactions in a little more detail. What kind of a reaction is it when ATP is changed into ADP? Well, that, of course, is a dephosphorylation. A phosphate group is removed. What about the other reaction? NADPH changes back into NADP+. Well, the plus sign here tells you that this molecule has lost some electrons. So NADPH is going to be oxidized into NADP+. It will release its energized electrons into the reactions of the Calvin cycle. Now we need some raw materials to build our glucose out of. Where do those come from? Well, that's where good old CO2 comes in. Remember that CO2 was a waste product in cellular respiration. Here it's a necessary reactant. Six of these little CO2 molecules are going to be needed to build glucose because if you remember, glucose contains six carbons. It's C6H12O6. Those depleted energy carriers that we end up with after this reaction are then going to travel back to the light reactions and start this cycle over again. The enzymes that catalyze the dark reactions, also known as the light independent reactions, are out in the stroma of the chloroplast. So we're not on the thylakoids anymore. Now we're out here in this thick liquid. What we're actually trying to make through the synthesis part of photosynthesis are sugars. Now we're not going to start out by building the big sugars. We need to build small sugars first and then we can use those little sugars to make the bigger ones. The sugar that's actually going to be produced through the Calvin cycle is this one, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. It's okay if you just know it by its abbreviation, G3P. G3P is a three carbon sugar, so there would be one there, there, and there. And it can be used as a building block, almost as a monomer, to build the big sugars like glucose. Glucose, if you remember, has six carbons in its chain. We would need two glyceraldehydes to make one of these glucose molecules. The Calvin cycle, or the Calvin-Benson cycle, sometimes also called the C3 cycle, is anabolic in nature. So it is endergonic. It's a building type of reaction that requires an input of energy. In order to make our one little sugar, our one little G3P, we're going to require three CO2s. So the CO2s are actually going to enter this cycle in groups of three. 
The Calvin cycle may look a little bit like the Krebs cycle to you that we studied back in Chapter 9, but there are a few important distinctions. First, the Calvin cycle is anabolic in nature. It's endergonic. So what we're trying to do is build something. Specifically, we're trying to build this little sugar. And we're going to have to take in some energy from energy carriers to do that. The Krebs cycle was exergonic or catabolic. In that reaction, we were taking acetyl-CoA and breaking it down a little at a time and pulling that energy out and putting it into energy carrier molecules. The other important distinction is that in the Krebs cycle, we had one molecule entering at a time. One acetyl-CoA would go in, go through the steps, and be finished. In the Calvin cycle, though, we have groups of molecules entering all at once. For instance, we start with three CO2s, and they end up making three, uh, three of these molecules, and then end up making six of these molecules, for instance. So we have groups of molecules interacting with one another in each step. The first phase of the Calvin cycle is known as carbon fixation. This is the step in which we're going to capture our little carbons in the form of three CO2s. So three CO2s are going to go in. Now just as in the Krebs cycle, we need to have some pre-existing molecule to stick them to, to add them to. And that molecule for us is going to be RUBP. RUBP consists of five carbons each. So we're going to stick a little carbon from carbon dioxide onto this five carbon molecule, and we're going to temporarily make a molecule that has six carbons in it. So five plus one makes six, and there's three of those because we had three CO2s going in. Now in the second part of this phase, those six carbon molecules are going to get snapped in half into this molecule, which is just called PGA. You can just know it by its abbreviation. Now because we had three six carbon molecules, when we split those in half, we end up making six three carbon molecules. So the number of carbons um, still adds up. Now that we've added our three carbon atoms to this cycle, in other words, we've fixed our three carbon atoms to other molecules, we can now take those molecules into phase two of the cycle, which is known as reduction. What's going to get reduced? Well, the thing that's going to be reduced are the six PGA molecules that we ended up with at the end of phase one. Without going into a lot of detail, those PGA molecules are going to get converted and changed around into our six little sugars, six G3Ps. Now this process is endergonic, it requires energy. So that's where our little energy molecules that we filled up through the light reactions are going to come in. Six of our ATPs are going to come along and they are going to drop off six phosphates. They're going to add them to those PGAs and it's going to make this intermediate product. The ATPs are dephosphorylated and now have to go back to the light reactions and get refilled. We're also going to use up six of our NADPHs from the light reactions here. They're going to get broken down into six NADP pluses. They're going to drop off some of their energized electrons, and that's going to provide the energy to convert this intermediate into six of our little G3P sugars. So we made it. We're finally at the sugar step. That was the point of the synthesis reactions. At this point, you may be thinking, fantastic, we made six sugars. This was a really profitable little cycle. Well, I've got some bad news for you. We're not going to be able to take away and use all six of these little sugars that we made. Why is that? Why can't we use them all? Well, if we just wanted this set of reactions to occur once and make those six little sugars, sure, we could take them all and use them to make glucose and sucrose and starch and other things. But we want this process to be a cycle. We want it to happen over and over and over again so we can continually make sugars, so we can continually make these bigger products. So let's do a little math. The cycle began with three of these molecules called RUBPs. Each one of those RUBPs contained five carbons. So five times three gives us 15 carbons total. So we need 15 carbons to start this cycle. Now let's look at the sugars that we have. We have six of these sugars, and each contains three carbons. Six times three means we have 18 carbons to play with. That means that we can 
take away one of these sugars and use it for other things. But we really need the remaining five to go back into the cycle so that we can start this process over again. So the profit from this cycle is one little tiny sugar, half a glucose, essentially. And the remaining five sugars go back into the cycle to start it again. Phase three of the Calvin cycle is going to allow it to start over again. It's known as the recycling of RUBP or the regeneration of RUBP. So what we're going to do in this phase is take those five three carbon sugars, those little sugars that we have left over, and we're going to rearrange them back into RUBP. Each RUBP contains five carbons. So we're going to go from five three carbon sugars to three five carbon sugars. This requires several steps, and it is endergonic. It does require some energy. So three more ATPs are going to get broken down in this phase. They're going to be dephosphorylated, and that energy is going to be used to reform our RUBP. At this point, those RUBPs can grab some more CO2, and it can start the cycle over again. Three of those. I mentioned that this Calvin cycle is anabolic or endergonic. So how much did it cost us to make one little tiny sugar? Well, if you add up all of the different steps and all of the different costs, you'll find that it cost us nine ATPs and six NADPHs to make one little G3P. Remember that to make a glucose molecule, we actually need two of these G3Ps. So total, it would take us 18 ATPs and 12 NADPHs to build one glucose molecule. That's a pretty energy hungry process. Congratulations you guys, you're finished. You made it to the end of this very dense, very complex chapter. Bob Ross would be proud of you. Make sure that you thoroughly fill out your notes and give each of those practices, those your turns a try. Bring him to class with you and we'll discuss them and work our way through that material so that hopefully it makes sense. Thank you very much. Plants provide us with food to eat and oxygen to breathe. They perform this amazing feat by the process of photosynthesis. Let's take a closer look. Photosynthesis requires carbon dioxide, which diffuses into the leaf through small pores, and then enters the cells. Inside the cell, carbon dioxide diffuses into the chloroplasts, where photosynthesis takes place. Chloroplasts use energy from light to transform carbon dioxide and water into sugar and oxygen. Zooming into a chloroplast, we see these flattened membranous sacs called thylakoids. Here, light energy is converted to chemical energy in the first phase of photosynthesis, the light reactions. The two green structures you see here are photosystems, large complexes of proteins and chlorophyll that capture light energy. An electron transport chain connects the two photosystems. Notice the small mobile electron carriers that shuttle electrons from one large complex to another. Now let's take a closer look at the steps of the light reactions. The photosystem on the left absorbs light energy, exciting electrons that enter the electron transport chain. Electrons are replaced with electrons stripped from water, creating oxygen as a byproduct. The energized electrons flow down the electron transport chain releasing energy that is used to pump hydrogen ions, the blue balls, into the thylakoid. In the photosystem on the right, light energy excites electrons, and this time the electrons are captured by an electron carrier molecule, NADPH. The high concentration of hydrogen ions inside the thylakoid powers ATP synthase, producing ATPs. The light reactions in the thylakoid have produced two energy products, ATP and NADPH that will now power the production of sugar in the Calvin cycle. 
The Calvin cycle takes place outside the thylakoids in the stroma, the thick fluid of the chloroplast. At the beginning of the cycle, carbon dioxide molecules combine with molecules called RUBP. The resulting molecules go through a series of reactions powered by ATP and NADPH from the light reactions. Sugar molecules known as G3Ps are produced. Most of the G3Ps are rearranged back into RUBPs that will begin the Calvin cycle again. But the important product of photosynthesis is the remaining G3P sugar. Some G3Ps are used to build glucose, which can combine into starch or cellulose. Still other G3Ps form sucrose. And some of the sugar is broken down by cellular respiration using oxygen in the plant's own mitochondria, generating ATPs that can power other work of the plant. Excess oxygen diffuses out of the leaf through the pores, while more carbon dioxide enters. With three simple ingredients, carbon dioxide, water, and light, plants produce sugar and oxygen by photosynthesis, powering plant metabolism and ultimately providing your fuel as well.